Wrestling I'm Miss Water. Welcome back, guys. Welcome. It's your boy Sean. And your girl yes, Mel. Yes, yes. Welcome back, guys. Welcome back, guys. Welcome. How are you feeling in I'm today? feeling I'm feeling amazing. That's great. How are you feeling, my love? I'm feeling good. Good. Hope you guys get out some there. of this good energy. Feeling good out there. All, All right. right, guys. So today we got our guy Thomas Sowell. Black culture keeps blacks down. This is why. Wow. I want to know the reason why. Black culture keeps blacks down. Like I'm ready to get into this I mean, video. This I don't even want to so, talk. You know, I just want to listen. Like you ready? Educated. Yes, I'm ready. You All ready right, to get into let's it? Let's go. All right, let's go ahead and get into it, guys. But first, make sure you smash that like button, give this video a big fat thumbs up, and also subscribe to the channel, and we appreciate it. Here we go. Okay. Let's get into it. Thomas Sowell. The culture in which they grew up with was, was not the culture in which black kids grew up in America today. <laughs> So they had There's no gangster rap. In Ger uh, 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 that, that was pervasively uh, uh, available in Germany. I mean, the, the, the average of, of black kid today, I think, is probably uh, better off, certainly materially, than uh, say Ben Ben Carson was when he was growing up. Ben Carson, the famous uh, black surgeon at Johns Hopkins. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, who I, is immensely accomplished in every way. Yes. Right. Uh, I would say that um, certainly the black kids who uh, are growing up today have a higher material standard of living than I had. Most uh, the only the diff difference was that uh, the schools were good when I came along. They were especially good in New York at that time, hard as that is to believe. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, the kids who grew up that, in that same place where I lived they will not get that same education. Oh. Now that can be blamed on somebody, but it has- Okay, let's, let's stop it right there. Is that the problem that we're having? The education the system, education, most definitely. You know, Kids because it definitely learning. changed. Yeah. You know, it's just a different learning, you know, system that they had. Kids are not learning. They took like they, the church and the prayer out of school. Most definitely. You know, so that was big. Here we go, guys, here we go. Very little to do with what happened uh, 100 or 200 years ago. And it's true in other countries. I mean, uh, in Nigeria, for example, there's a tribe, the Igbos, who are living in one of the least, least fertile parts of Nigeria, uh, who were in fact enslaved uh, in centuries past by other tribes and so on. Uh, when, when the British moved in and set up schools, the Igbos went for the schools. By the time Nigeria became uh, independent, the Igbos had climbed above the other groups that had been ahead of them uh, to begin with. So, that, wow. But there are all kinds of uh, cross currents of factors, uh, the particular culture or the particular geography. You, you run through the whole list of them. Here's, you, you cite, in Intellectuals and Race, you cite an observation by the intelligence expert, IQ scientist, James Flynn, that just stopped me cold. Mm. After the Second World War, you've got large numbers of, of American troops remaining in Germany. For that matter, there's still several tens of thousands there today. And both black and white American soldiers had children with German women. Mm. And Flynn discovered uh. that those children growing up in Germany mm. showed no IQ differences at all. Mm. The, the, okay. the black kids and the white kids, the same. Quote, quoting intellectuals and race, Professor Flynn concluded that the reason was that the offspring of black soldiers in Germany, and now you're quoting Professor Flynn, grew up in a nation with no black subculture. Yeah. Close quote. Wow. Which means what? Which means they experienced exactly the same expectations. Is this the... They, no, no, no. The expectations are external. The culture in which they grew up with was, was not the culture in which black kids grew up in America today. So they had There's no gangster rap. In Ger uh, 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 that, that was pervasively uh, uh, available in Germany. So here's wow. what I'm getting. There is something about. I gotta stop it right there because it seems like he's trying to make a point. Like the gangster rap really messed up our black culture. Of course it did. It was poisonous. Um, it's still poisonous. It's venomous to the culture. It, it, I mean, I mean, think of the lyrics. The they're lyrics not nice was, lyrics. It's not about love. Uh, it, they are very explicit lyrics. Yeah. Um, 
And I think that like messed up the children just by listening to it. It messed us up, you know, growing up. Yeah, I mean, just by listening to it of every course. day, your mind is framed to, you know, to be like that rapper. Most definitely. To do things like that rapper. To say things like that rapper. Here we go. This yeah. is this is deep. To dress go. like that rapper. Yep. Wear your absolutely. pants hanging off your butt. Yep, absolutely. Here we go. Out. Black subculture in America today mm. that holds African Americans themselves back? Yes. <laughs> in fact, I, I, I went into this in a previous uh, book in which, uh, uh, about bl black rednecks and white liberals. Because that same let's, subculture... We'll, we'll, let's talk about two of your books here. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Book, because that very sub same subculture held white, whites in the South back as well. That in the time, this, this uh, mental testing in the First World War turned up, among other things, the fact that uh, whites from various, oh, four or five southern states scored lower on the mental test than, than blacks from four or five northern states. And so it really was a question of the subculture that was there, which was a handicap to both. All right. And so whose job is it to say, wrong subculture, folks, you're, har you're harming yourselves? Well, I would think in an ideal world that intellectuals might take on that task. But uh, the world that we live in, I've noticed, is not, not ideal. All right. Wow. wow. What is to be done? Take a look at President Lyndon Johnson speaking at Howard University in 1965. Oh, yes. But freedom is not enough. You do not wipe away the scars of centuries by saying now, you are free to go where you want and do as you desire and choose the leaders you please. You do not take a person who for years has been hobbled by chains and liberate him, bringing up to the starting line of a race and then say, you are free to compete with all the others and still justly believe that you have been completely fair. Wow, that it's, is it's so pathetic. deep. It's not a question of, there's that no you so who has the control to be completely fair or completely unfair. I mean, the circumstances are, so someone once criticized the mental test on grounds that the tests were unfair. And, uh, what, and I think it was David Reisman who said, the tests are not unfair, life is unfair, and the tests are measuring the results. Yeah. But who has control of life? Who has control of the past? Who has control of the culture that people have in the present, which they've inherited from the past? Mm. So Lyndon Johnson, he's in fact, although good liberal that he was, at least in regard, Lyndon Johnson had a complicated career and changed positions on issues many times, but good liberal though he was at that moment, he was in fact engaging in a breathtaking arrogance. Yes. On two counts. One, that white people were the ones who were responsible for where black people stood in the race, mm. that it was up to whites entirely. That blacks, as he described, I'm, I'm putting this to you, it's a devastating passive, they're acted upon. That's right, that's right. And then the second act of arrogance is the supposition that somehow the federal government could fix it. Yes, uh, it, it, it is staggering. Uh, but if, if you wanted to be charitable, you could say, well, he said this in 1965. But if you say, all right, why are people now repeating it in 2013 when we've had uh, uh, nearly half a century uh, of experience to the contrary? And if you look within the black community, those blacks who had escaped what I call the black redneck culture, they've moved on. So, but it is, it's, in, it's, 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 it's the culture that different parts of the black community had. They were, they were different. Mm. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, in his famous 1965 report entitled, The Negro Family, The Case for National Action, close quote. Longish, longish quotation, but it gets to something, I believe. Moynihan, the fundamental problem is that of family structure. The Negro family in the urban ghettos is crumbling. A middle class has managed to save itself, mm. but for vast numbers of the unskilled and poorly educated, the fabric of conventional social relationships has all but disintegrated. So long as this situation persists, the cycle of poverty, 
and disadvantage will continue to repeat itself. Close quote. When Moynihan wow. wrote those words, the illegitimacy rate among African Americans was 25%. Mm. Today, the illegitimacy rate among white Americans is 36%. Mm. Among Hispanics, more than 50%. And among African Americans, more than 70%. Yes. Wow. Aside from throwing up your hands in despair, what, despair. what, what is to be done? It's not getting first, the done. first thing to be done is to understand that this was a result of policies begun in the 1960s. This is not a legacy of what happened 100 years before the 1960s. The breakdown of the black family is not a legacy of slavery. No. If you, uh, the, the, the classic study of this goes all the way back to the era of slavery, and they find that most uh, black kids, even under slavery, had lived with two, with two parents. And that was true all the way up until the 1960s. Uh, and so you, if you really want to find out what has what's changed, it has changed since the 1960s. And the okay. fact that, that, that whites now have a higher rate of illegitimacy than blacks had when Moynihan wrote suggests that this is uh, something that spreads out. But, but if you look at something else, if you look at those blacks, and look at black husband-wife families, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, poverty rate among such families has been in single digits ever since every year since 1994, and yeah. so so we, so if you look at the if you look at the external causes, why the the the, the husband and wife families and the uh, welfare single mo mom families all are, are facing the same uh, society and objective things, but the but the results are radically different because the cultures and values are different. So exactly. you would you would roll back welfare, I guess that's the principal policy. You, 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 let's, okay, so what would Tom Sowell do? One, you'd, roll, you'd eliminate welfare, you'd reform welfare, what would you do? Roll it back. All right. And what about affirmative action? Eliminate it. Just gone. Yeah. Colorblind yeah. policy completely. All right. What prospect for that do you see? None. No, black, no black leader of any standing. I'm talking about a political leader as opposed to an intellectual such right. as yourself. You've got, well, there's you, there's Walter Williams. Uh, is there, do you get the sense that there's, a, that, that there's a growing generation, a rising generation of African-American intellectuals who say, enough of this, I'm with Tom Sowell? Well, I don't know if they'll go that far. There's no point. <laughs> that being, would be asking being, a lot. <laughs> being, there's no point being reckless. Uh, but but uh, I, I think uh, there are people like, like uh, Shelby Steele and many others, uh, Larry Elder, you can run through a long list. And there are more such, pe more such people now than there were, say, in the 1970s. But in terms of political leaders, all the, all the incentives politically are for, for black leaders to blame all problems in the black community on the larger society. And that enables them to take on the role of being the defender of the black community against enemies, which in turn... Uh, creates the situation in which many blacks don't feel that anything that they do is going to, is going to help themselves unless it's done politically as, as a group. That there's no point. I mean, why, why would you, if you believe what, the, what, that's what they say, that's true. why would you want to knock yourself out in the school knowing that the man is not going to let you get anywhere? Yep, that well, one of the most pathetic things I heard in like recent a, years like a was a young black man saying that, you know, at one point he thought he would join the Air Force and become a pilot. And then he says he realized that the white man is not going to let a black man become a pilot. Wow. And he was saying this decades after the Tennessee Airmen had established their reputation in combat in Europe. You know, but, he, but the hopelessness, hopelessness is, is one of the big products of the, of the race industry. That, that you, have, you have no chance. I remember giving a talk at Marquette, and at the end of the talk, among the questions that was asked, a young, again, young black man got up and he said, even though I am graduating from Marquette uh, University, what hope is there for me? And uh, wow. having gone through college when I was in the 50s, I don't remember any blacks the, saying that in the 1950s, when there was a lot more obstacles to overcome than there were when this guy is graduating from Marquette. But you, but you have to pr pr produce that kind of feeling in order to serve the interests of those in the race industry. Final question then. 
This is so deep. Maybe we can, maybe we can think in terms of that young man at Marquette. Or let, let's put it this way. Somewhere, watching this interview, there's a young Thomas Sowell. There's an African-American who's smart and wants to do something with his life. What's, it seems to me I've all, we've already got one piece of advice you'd offer to him is stay away from the from the races industry. Stay away from the what race what, ad, what advice race hustlers. Race what hustlers. advice would you give a young Thomas Sowell? How do you make something of yourself as an African American in America today? The way anybody else would. You equip yourself with skills that people are willing to pay for. Mr. Thomas Sowell. Equip yourself with skills that um, people are willing to pay for. Most definitely. He's so educated and have a bunch of knowledge. Yes. Um, I would just love to hear him speak and talk. That was a very nice interview. Yeah. Very informative. And yes. it made me think a lot. I've heard a lot of black people, you know, have that negativity towards, like, becoming anything oh yeah you know it doesn't matter because white people are gonna they're not gonna let you have it or i'm like wow that's a very negative way of thinking like with that it type of thinking way. you'll never get anywhere in life i don't think that people should think it's like a that. mindset i think that you know people should think you know sky's the limit no most matter what. definitely just go as far as you can go and i feel like poverty slavery all of those things are like mental. Yeah. Like a mind, your mindset. You have to change yep. your mindset. Once you change your mindset, you can change your life. You can change everything. Because you know, let's let's just be honest. We're just not in those times right now. Most definitely. Those times is like in the past. Yes. It's a different game right now. You and know like what you saying? said, race hustlers. Like race hustlers. there are people out here making money on. People being ignorant, thinking that, yep. you know, oh, because of my race or these people are racist. So, you know, we're not yeah. going to get anywhere because they want you to think like that. They want you to keep that mindset. And, I, you know, I, I don't I don't really think that's true. I just think that, you know, you can people be whatever you want to be. Yes. It's, you know what I'm saying? Doors are wide open. Yes. There's opportunities out here. Most you know, definitely. You go to school, you learn as much as you can possibly learn. Yes. And you go, you know, in the right direction. Most definitely. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You have choices. So um, you just got to make the right decisions. Yes, I agree. Yep. Um, and like our oldest daughter, Layla, you know, she's in college. She's doing a thing. She got yes. a wide open opportunities to be yeah. whatever she want to be. Most definitely. So um, some things just go right over the top of my head. You know, it's like. We're just living in different times. Yes. You know, yes. so. But I just love to hear Mr. Thomas. Um, Spread some knowledge. Just, you yes. know what I mean? Just put that knowledge out there. Yes. So we can just get that. So we can yes. just let it soak in. Knowledge is power. Yep, it's power. Knowledge is power. Wisdom, wisdom. Yeah. That's what's up. All right, guys. That's our time. Um, We definitely had a blast. Yes. You know what I'm saying? We definitely had a blast. Appreciate you guys being here. With us, locked and loaded. And also the interviewer. He was asking yes. very good questions. Some good questions. I loved his questions because yep. some of those questions I wanted to know the answers to. Great, so uh, he touched on some amazing topics. Yep. They even went as far as back as Lyndon Johnson making that speech. Yes. And that was a powerful speech. You know Most what I'm saying? Definitely. Yeah. Um, wow. Just some good information. Yeah. Yeah. So we thank you guys. Go ahead and smash that like button. Get inside the comment section. Turn on all notifications. That's it. All right. Signing off, guys. All right. Y'all have a blessed day. We're about to Peace. Peace.